Good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Flesch. I'm the director of the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museums, and welcome to this sixth of seven presentations as part of the 2023 Winter Lyceum. Today is the 26th day of March 2023, and we're broadcasting from Platteville, Wisconsin, home of the world's largest letter M in the heart of the hilly Driftless area in a special place known as the Upper Mississippi Valley Lead and Zinc Mining Region where the Badger State was born. Founded in 1965 by the city of Platteville, the museum brings to life a rich cultural heritage rooted in the local history, a tradition of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and a celebration of pioneering which we recognize to be the living human spirit of ingenuity, inquiry, enterprise, and development. I invite you to stay up to date on museum programs and to support current initiatives online at www.mining.jameson.museum. This year's Winter Lyceum continues to be a truly electrifying series of seven presentations on the theme of energy in the context of our driftless area landscape and current events. The subjects of the talks have ranged from generating and storing energy in historic mines to solar and wind energy production to organic farming. This evening, we'll shift gears as we promote conscious thinking in architecture and design and look at nature as an opportunity to expand the dialogue on energy. It's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening to enjoy a presentation by designer Ari Georges titled Energy of Nature nature of energy. I'd like to thank all of you who have registered to participate live today, as well as those who may be watching watching a recording of this event from our library of virtual programs. Welcome current friends of the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museum members and donors, and big thank you to the sponsors whose financial support has made this program possible. A&W Restaurant of Platteville, Claire Bank, Edward Jones Financial Advisor Bob Hunthausen, Inspiring Community, Southwest Health, State Farm Agent Jordan Holthouse, and Tricor Insurance. And now before we begin our program, I'd like to invite you to participate in a question and answer session and a short survey at the end of this evening's presentation. Because we're a very large online group, in the interest of time, I'd like to invite you to type out your questions as they come to mind and to submit them via the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen during the talk. And at the end, our speaker will answer as many of the questions as he's able in the order in which they are received. So I'm now pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. Ari Georges is a design teacher, graphic designer, an artist, and an architectural design professional. As a design teacher, Ari draws from European education, American graduate studies, and more than 25 years of apprenticeship in architectural and creative studios, both in the EU and in the United States, during uh, his American preparatory school years at Anatolia College in Greece. Ari was tutored by two practicing architects when he developed his strong architectural focus and dedication to a life in design. He studied architecture at the University of Florence in Italy and received his Bachelor of Architectural Studies and Masters of Architecture degrees from Taliesin, the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture, majoring in organic architecture and graphic design. After graduation, he became a voting senior fellow of the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, later director of curriculum at the School of Architecture. Ari's graduate courses that he taught included uh, Advanced Design Studio, Research Design Studio, Graphic Design, Hand Drawing and Rendering, and Nature Patterns. He often conducts public talks and workshops on geometric abstraction inspired by nature. In addition to teaching, Ari is an installation artist in temporary place making, uh, utilizing tension fabrics. Ari calls his fabric, fabric installations space shaping. Ari is the founder of uh, Ohm Studio, a design studio dedicated to enhancing life's experience through design that further develops the home design principles he practiced and taught uh, for more than 20 years at Taliesin. The Ohm Studio design process is rooted in a deep appreciation of nature and organic design principles and utilizing geometry as a design discipline. Ohm Studio has a fruitful partnership with Lindahl Cedar Homes and offers a portfolio of mid-century modern inspired custom homes for his architectural clients. Ari was my most influential teacher in graduate school at Taliesin, and I'm most profoundly honored that he's sharing his wisdom with our museum audience this evening. 
please join me in welcoming Ari Georges. Thank you so much, Eric. Give me a second to do the technical part here. Okay, I think we should be ready. So yes, first of all, Eric, thank you for the lovely introduction. I'll be a little longer <laughs> than I'm comfortable with. Um, and thank you all for taking time on a Sunday to join us here today. I personally value that the act of making time to show up to one another is one of the most precious gifts we can exchange. So. I will try to make uh, your time worthwhile. Um, borrowing from a musical term, prelude, which is a dear frankly right term as well. Um, I'd like to share with you a little bit how I prepared for tonight. Uh, when Eric asked me to contribute to this series and shared the theme of energy, I asked myself, obviously, what can I add? Um, so I will invite you to go along with me through this presentation. Uh, while I rely on, on our remarkable human capacity to naturally tend towards knowledge. Uh, we're all curious beings. We'd like to understand the world better. Uh, we're, we're bored with only thinking the same thing all the time. So in the next hour or so, I will open a part of my world as I'm experiencing it, making various associations, connections, and I hope to at least be entertaining. Uh, if not offering you a chance to examine your own ideas and preconceptions as they relate to the topic. I hope that uh, we can have a spirited Q&A session at the end, uh, which I always enjoy whenever I do presentations because spontaneity replaces the preparedness. Um, so this will be, in a way, a, a journey through the uh, mind in abstraction. And I say this with a certain... Um, understanding that abstraction may be a term that could sound uh, disorienting. Uh, it really means, if nothing else, the reduction to essence, the reduction to something that is uh, simple but not simplistic, that it's clear, and at the same time encapsulates uh, a bigger idea. So I'm personally immersed in a life in architecture, albeit in a particular approach the organic approach, as Franklin Wright called it, and from which I learned through his school in our native driftless area. Uh, speaking of the driftless area, we all have an idea in our minds of this special part of uh, southwestern Wisconsin and its neighboring states. But an image like this one, which I recently saw on a wall, some, some building, completely randomly, it paused me because it made it immediately evident how this area is special. And something is different in the pattern of Wisconsin we all have in our minds. Uh, in that corner, something else is happening. Now, I believe that if, if we give it enough attention and time, it may reveal layers of information that, and understanding even without sharing any words. For example, soon enough, we see where the Wisconsin River cuts through it. We see how the tributaries create these beautiful hills and valleys along, along the way. And soon enough, we have a sense of place that's created by simple, a simple image that is not typically included when we think of the map of Wisconsin as, as a shape, as, a, as a, almost like its own symbol. Um, so in short, I do think that visualization is a capability we all have. Some of us more cultivated and advanced than others, but we all have it as our nature. And I do believe that it is a powerful way of understanding beyond words, because with visualization, we at least avoid the prospect of, of arguing. Now, of course, I'm not, I'm not a hopeless romantic, so I understand that in today's reality, visualization can also be overwhelming. Uh, in the present state of our world, we are experiencing an explosion of continuous visual stimulation, if not anything else but those icons that are everywhere. Um, it's almost an assault on our retinas, and it often leaves us with an inescapable sense of helplessness. So to navigate this image-heavy re reality, I agree with the notion that we develop discerning capabilities and to keep our minds from saturating and overloading. 
I think this is known as what experts call pattern recognition. And it's something that neuroscience now is examining a lot more carefully as it's analyzing the brain. Um, pattern recognition is at the basis of memory. It's at the basis of our cells being able to function. So to a certain degree, this, uh, this overload of imagery in today's world, in our daily lives, is also a training process for how to become more uh, capable recognizers of pattern and eventually support the concept of systems thinking, which in a way is the, the overarching theme of tonight's presentation in, in, a, in, a system, in a systems thinking capability. So for example, if you look at this image, this only records daily flights in the United States. The, the lines are the flight paths and then the brighter areas are the hubs of airports where airlines have a lot of traffic going in and out. Now, even though this is not a map of the United States, we can all see the United States map in it. In other words, something in our mind is reconstructing our memory of the United States and the data of these flights in a way present us the underlying uh, reality of where these flights are occurring. So we're able to see a, a, something that's not what it's not a map when maybe make it maybe may make it a map in our minds. So I find that to be uh, uh, one of the ways that we calibrate our understanding through visual visualization. In other words, we can see something and through that see something else, which I think is the key aspect of what I'm going to try to share with you uh, this evening. Now let's go back to this amazing word Lyceum. I know Eric and I have spent, spent many, many hours while he was an apprentice at Taliesin in the conversations about philosophy and reason and logic and really beautiful conversations. He is a very dedicated thinker and I, I applaud him for that because in today's culture, uh, sometimes thinking is not valued as much as it should. But nonetheless, uh, in order of the famous uh, Socratic method, um, I would like to offer you the way I understand some of these key words. And of course, uh, Lyceum is a word that uh, was fathered by the famous Greek philosopher Aristotle. Uh, of course, Aristotle is considered the father of the scientific method, the, the father of present day logic. He was preoccupied with close observation of the manifest world of nature, what he could see and touch and examine, from which he developed the mechanics of reason and logic that still used to the present world. However, he himself was a student of Plato. And of course, Plato, who we know from his famous dialogues, he wrote these dialogues between Socrates and someone else, is the definitive reference to Western philosophy. Now, Plato was preoccupied with ideas and the non-manifest conceptions of the mind that exist in and, the, in and of themselves. For example, a number can be witnessed in connection with a manifest object. We can say one tree, 10 cars, 60 participants, but itself a number cannot be seen anywhere. So he called this idea, this capability of seeing an abstract idea, the forms and the platonic forms as they're known. Now, of course, Plato would not exist without Socrates. Socrates was was this fellow that walked around Athens and talked to people. He never wrote anything and he's been immortalized in the dialogues of Plato. And we know Socrates primarily in this reference to the Socratic method or the Elenchus as it's known in Greek. Uh, he, he really never called it that himself, obviously. What he did is by claiming ignorance, Socrates would propose key statements to some interlocutor and made them agree to them. But then as he was proceeding and they were all impossible to disagree with, he, there, were, there were positive statements instead of questions. And, and then in that, then he would reveal a contradiction in the admission the interlocutor was making. Now, why would a contradiction be important? Well, the goal of Socrates was to arrive at intelligibility. If something is not intelligible, you cannot count it as knowledge. And so intelligibility overall is the, defined by the absence of any contradiction. 
In other words, a thing cannot be and not be at the same time. You know, Socrates' life, of course, ended in demise. Uh, we Greeks were responsible for that. He was accused of disrespecting the gods by the powers of the Athenian democracy and was sentenced to death by suicide. It wasn't even a direct execution. And while his acolytes and students had conceived of a plan to save him and flee Athens, he claimed that the democratic process must prevail even if flawed and he drank the hemlock. And, and I think that had he not, had he fled, who knows if we would even talk about him today. So that just as a little background, since this is part of my, my upbringing, I grew up with these ideas and, and it was amazing to come to, to the United States as a young student and find that, that uh, they play a role, these concepts of, uh, of the high standards and the high ideals, even of the founding fathers are rooting in some of these uh, ancient uh, origins. Now, for today's topic, I want to recalibrate some key, some key terms like the, the word energy, the word nature, the word creative, geometry, patterns, all of those things that I've already mentioned and Eric mentioned. Uh, I think it's part of uh, our ability to, to use a common frame of reference. Now, each of you have their, your own meanings associated with these words. My goal is to give you an alternative view into them, especially because some of them uh, in themselves, they, they originate in the Greek language, but some of them also in meaning they originate in the Greek language. So let's start with the word energy. It's a co composite word and, and it's with the N, which is an actual preposition and ergo. It tra translates loosely to the innate force that can lead to action, that can lead to work. So energy is a force that seemed to be inhabiting everything, uh, you know, it, it's, it's inherent in our reality. Now, what's interesting about this word is closely associated in Greek with the word that we translate as create or creator. Now, demos in ergo, demos is the part that is the same root that creates democracy. It's basically the public. So in the ancient Greek idea, creativity was measured by how one could share the work, the ideas publicly. You know, you have to remember that back then it was city states, so Athens was a closed system. So if you were part of that system, you were expected to be publicly engaged. In fact, the word idiot that we use today originates in the word private in ancient Greek. So if a citizen was claiming privacy, that meant that they were not participating in the commons, in the demos. And so democracy cannot exist with people taking exemption. So I don't know how it ended up calibrated into something that maybe means lesser intelligence. Maybe that's, that's uh, somehow implied. If somebody is doing the obviously wrong thing, maybe they don't have too much uh, faculty. But nonetheless, I was fascinated by the word energy being embedded in the idea of creative energy. Now, the second word that is part of the, th the theme today is, is nature. And, and the Greek word is phusis, species, which obviously translates on one hand into the expected, the physical reality. We use it today uh, exactly like that. It sounds like that. But there's another aspect of the, of the term phusis that is in philosophy, which is the question of what is the nature of something? When somebody says, well, this is in, in their nature to do X, Y, and Z, what does that really mean? What is the nature of something? Of course, both of these uh, calibrated ideas of, of nature are originating in Aristotle. So let's look at uh, this idea of the energy of nature. Uh, and in this case, I'm not going to talk about the universe because that's too big of a scale. Uh, even though there is this interesting... Um, map the astronomers are making of the universe and um and in a sense they uh they're trying to collect all data that is possible to create some kind of visual representation of it these dots represent galaxies in my understanding and and i think these um this movement represents their existence in time now even a galaxy though like the milky way our home is too big of a scale to discuss the idea of nature I'd like to just focus on, on, on our planet Earth. And just for, for the sake of you know, you know, 
entertaining the mind. Here is some interesting stats that I don't think most of us have memorized or most of us are even aware of. So the age of the planet is about 4.5 billion years. The length of the equator is 24.8 thousand miles. The volume of the planet is almost 260 billion cubic miles. The surface is 196 million square miles of which 71% is water. And so our world is largely unknown to us because none of us really, the, the, the ocean is the mystery. We can float on it, but what happens in those abysmal depths? None of us know. So the reality of our quick reference is, is on the 29%. And, and of that, how many of us have traveled the land part of the world to, to even know it as a direct experience? Most of us have stayed in a relatively uh, limited area. Um, and so based on that very little experience of the planet itself, somehow our human nature is capable of taking a position of saying, I can answer for the planet, which I think is part of our collective um, challenge right now. So my mo most interesting start of, this, of, this, of all of these is that our speed of the orbit, the speed in which right at this minute we are all moving is 66, 66 thousand miles per hour so whether we like it or not we're on a spaceship it's a it's a body that moves through space we call it earth and whether it's a good thing to think of that or not i i, I try to remind myself that in a way it's kind of like a family trip <laughs> where we overload everybody in the same place you know and we experience the immediate consequences of that is the crowdedness the confined space you know, the, are we there yet? But imagine that on this planet, this trip doesn't have a destination. It keeps going round and round perpetually. And imagine that none of us can stop it and get out. So anything we're doing in it has effect on everything and everyone. So that just as a background, the way, the way that I daily try to remind myself what is the, the thing that I call reality. Now, going back to how we treat our planet and our, and our and our ability to to think of especially the idea of energy one of the major problems in the present state is that we're our best practices uh, fall short in our application of systemic progress um, we are risking turning our efforts into mere greenwashes and not addressing serious issues until something catastrophic takes place, like the meltdown of Fukushima that you see the image of. Now, of course, planting greenery on buildings is something nature has been doing for a long time. On the right is an old church where ivy has grown, and all of us have seen ivy growing on buildings. On the right is supposedly an, a, a contemporary version of expressing sustainability. Now, any of us can be the judge of how effective, how far can that go? It's not a bad idea, but it's not the ultimate solution. Another problem we have in our present day uh, approach to all this is that we use three major forces to make our material world. And heating something in high temperatures that requires a lot of energy, beating it with high impact, which requires a lot of energy, or treating it with toxic chemicals, which eventually becomes um, effective in, this, in the surroundings. I mean, these chemicals have to go somewhere. Janine Benius, who is a biologist that has uh, co coined the term biomimicry, uh, claims that we only yield 4% of product out of this process. So we waste 96% of those forces in order to make our materials. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, no pun intended, to say that that cannot be sustainable. I mean, there's only this much energy that, that we can rely on. So what does nature do to make material? How does nature manifest its form? Well, it grows things. And, and it's amazing because um, as it grows things, it also puts them on a, on a life cycle. So there is growth, decay, decomposition, and recycling that happens in nature. You know, a tree produces a seed, a plant produces a seed, and it goes back. Even the, the, the more inert uh, manifestation of nature, like the, 
the rock for example and this this is the the one another topic in our in our conversations with eric since he has a geology background i was always picking his mind about how uh, how a geologist appreciates nature um, and I remember telling him, I, this, this is exciting in Arizona. You go see these beautiful uh, formations like the Grand Canyon and those. And he said, no, those are boring. I mean, when you see the horizontal evidence of something, it's just sediment on top of each other. For a geologist, geologist the exciting image is when you see a rock on its side and you have these diagonal lines going through, because that means that some major force tilted the ground itself. And, and, um, so even even in the inert solid aspect of the, of our reality, it doesn't have to be a plant that grows. Everything is in constant transformation uh, state on our planet. So biomimicry says that eventually our world will be in the technology that now we call it three D printing. Maybe this is not the final way of calling it, but uh, in a way, nature does three D printing. When a seed can produce a tree that's in a way a 3D printer, but it doesn't have big machines somewhere. And of course, nature uses materials like keratin and chitin to create a form, while we use at the moment, toxic plastics and resins to make 3D prints. Eventually that I hope will become even better. Now this, these I'm also submitting tonight as, as little hooks for you to maybe look further into. I'm not trying to give a whole um, academic lecture on these items. These are simply the types of stimulants that exist in my reality that I'm sharing, and I'm hoping that you can look into, into them further. So we all understand that in order to overcome major challenges, uh, the most important thing that can happen is when we shift the paradigm. Now, paradigm is another Greek word. It has to do with some reference that is exemplary, some reference that we all recognize without having to debate it. And so when a paradigm shifts, that means that the whole worldview reference for a collective society or a group of people shifts with it. Well, the, the kind of shift that I am experiencing, that I've experienced in my life, especially as a resident of the Driftless area through Frank Lloyd Wright, is asking myself, really how sensitive have I been to nature as a human being? And how do I recalibrate that sensitivity? You know, the, there's one thing to say, well, I like going on a hike. I like to observe beautiful landscapes, but these are only the, 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 the surface of the, of the matter. The true sensitization, I think, starts with an experience that I would call the creative response to nature. Nature, in a way, it's a call and response uh, song. You know, it, it gives us a stimulus and we, we are called to respond. So in the creative response, I find that we can overcome this, this blind material consumption and see nature as a reference for how we are all creative. And I don't think creative is a branch of education. I think creative is a condition that we all have as human beings. Our ability to imagine and on that imagination act and then through that action change our, our conditions change our reality i mean the most creative of all is agriculture if you think of it you know when we realize that we can um, use the ground to grow food i mean this is something that uh that i find i mean in other words creativity is not involving painting and sculpture in the arts it's a, it's part of of, of reality of, of our daily lives all right, so let's look at the other side of the, of, of the idea, the nature of energy. And here's where we're going to get a little philosophical, but not in the sense of, uh, you know, formal philosophy, more in a sense of what are the tools to understand the nature of energy, especially this creative energy we'll be talking about. All right, I will propose that the most powerful tool that that is available to us is understanding geometry. Now I know for a lot of people, this, is, this, this takes you back to grade school and the fear that this subject may have caused to many people. Uh, let's just use again linguistics to, to, to soften it a little bit. It's a composite word, geo and meter. So geo refers back to Gaia, which is the Greek name for earth. 
and meter, of course, is measure. So in a way, geometry is a way of understanding the earth, but also in a quantitative way. In other words, in order to be able to see parts and the connection of parts and whole. So in a way, it's the architecture of earth itself. If architecture is a term here used more culturally, more larger, like somebody would say he's the, he or she is the architect of, of a war, which we've heard you know, many a time, uh, there is an architecture, an idea of architecture in, embedded in earth itself. Of course, uh, geometry has, is not a new idea. I mean, since the human culture has been recorded, we have been using it as a tool to, to shape our civilization. I will not tire you with all the well-trodden methods in which geometry has been a tool of analysis or synthesis throughout art and architecture. But suffice it to say that every epoch has its own particular characteristics. I'm more interested in the lesser considered aspect of geometry and those that reveal the intrinsic connections that it has with nature, both in the Aristotelian meanings, the manifest and the abstract. So let's start with the most direct one, geometry in and of itself. This is a phrase, the in and of itself, that I find very, very important in, in my ability to understand and and articulate the world. Uh, in and of itself, again, refers back to something has an inherent capability. So in Euclid's elements, where he is a father of geometry as we know it, the fundamental axioms of geometry are established as the basis of knowing. In other words, I was uh, sharing with Eric earlier, if you don't have to have gone to school to see, let's say a car with, um, with square wheels and expect it, that means parked outside of the supermarket. And when you go out with your groceries, there is a car with square wheels. You don't have to have gone to school to realize that that is not going to go anywhere. In other words, our mind is, is able to understand that a square cannot roll, whereas a circle can. It is, it, is, it is that fundamental in the way that geometry plays in our ability to be intelligent. And in fact, in Plato's Academy, which was one of the first um, uh, schools in Athens, there was this um, message written on a stone above the entrance to the academy, which this is the Greek, it's, it's, it sounds like Ageometritos Mivisisito, and it translates into, without knowledge of geometry, no one should enter here. And we're talking about a school of philosophy, not a school of mathematics. Um, so geometry was the framework in philosophical tenets. In other words, when we talk about the Pythagorean theorem, if there is a visual aspect to it. It's not just uh, a formula. And in the visual aspects, you can, you can recognize what the formula is trying to say. So geometry played a huge role in philosophy. Another aspect in geometry that influenced the ancients is when they look up in the sky and they, they started seeing the movement of, of the stellar bodies in the, in the dark night sky. This image here is, for those of you who don't know it, is the shape that the planet Venus makes from our orbit on, on Earth. In other words, when the two orbits are between Venus and Earth as we both roll around the sun, Venus is making this beautiful pentagonal shape. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's recorded, it was seen by the ancients. Well, when you see something like that in the sky and you recognize that there is a certain consistency that maybe you can see it somewhere else in nature, in a flower, in a plant, you started making associations and ask, start asking questions. That is the basis of our what I think differentiates the human beings from other species on the planet is, at least as far as we know, that we think that we, we can extrapolate out of our observations a question and that question can lead into an examination and that examination will lead to more knowledge. So seeing geometry in nature is, is something that we all use daily. I mean, even negotiating these new roundabouts in Wisconsin that everybody seems to dislike. You know, you have to imagine your orbit, instead of being across an intersection, now having, having to go uh, in part around a circle uh, and how all of that together supposedly makes it a, sa a safest intersection of two roads. 
but there is also the geometry in mathematics that oftentimes is used in order to appreciate the beauty of mathematics. Now, this may be a little more of a silo because mathematics, again, can be uh, intimidating. This particular series of images is using a simple algorithm. It's called a ramification, which basically cr is created by taking a simple line, finding a point at which the line branches into two. And then at, at, a, at some point along these other two lines, another bifurcation and so on and so forth. And it creates almost like the tree structure, which you can see on the top left images. And if you progressively push the algorithm, it starts to fold into itself because it keeps turning, 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 turning. And in the end, it creates these abstractions that look these like beautiful shapes of concentric patterns that uh, some people call them mandalas, some people uh, seeing them, the, the concentric and tangential qualities of mathematics. This is simply taking a principle and, and I, I asking it to generate enough of itself until we recognize a pattern in it. Now, of course, physicists are realizing that in particle physics uh, theory, there are always um, for every particle, there is a, a corresponding particle somewhere else in space. And when they started finding out these relationships, they, were, they could map all the possible particles in physics. In fact, that's how they do research. This is called the E8 pattern. It's an interesting topic in and of itself. There's a really good TED talk by a physicist who is also a surfer in Hawaii, and he lives in a van, and his talk is wonderful. Uh, Garrett Lisi is his name. I would encourage you to, to look at it. It's very entertaining because he is not like the dry, boring physicist. He is actually a very interesting fellow. But he was trying to explain that when you, when you map out all of the, the possible location of particles, then you get these beautiful geometries. And in fact, in quantum theory, they have discovered recently that there is a geometric pattern. They call it the amplitohedron, which explains field theory in, in, in quantum theory in such a way that it has cut almost 20 years of research apparently when you apply the, the geometric model. You know, this is from uh, the publication of the work, the revelation that particle interactions, the most basic events in nature may be consequences of geometry significantly advances decades long effort to reformulate quantum field theory. So, in a sense, what I'm trying to say is that geometry is not something to be afraid of on one hand, and it's something that seems to be something you can't even avoid on another. That is something that we all carry with us, the ability to measure the earth, measure the planet. We are children of the planet in many ways, and the planet is what we need in order to, to be in this life. So it's in us to be able to to measure it both directly and, and abstractly in order to be in harmony with it. Uh, I also love when I see geometry in arts. In fact, this fellow, Mark Reynolds, considers himself a geometer, which I don't know if it's a term that's <laughs> um, often used, but he makes these beautiful hand drawings in which he simply ex examines and explores with his compass and straight edge uh, shapes and in a way he creates a world for the eye and the brain to be in which I would say is is fascinating in the fact that it, even with the first glance at it you may not fully understand what's going on but the one thing that it conveys at least to me I hope to you as well is that there's some kind of intelligence involved in how this was created it wasn't just simply throwing paint on a wall which I also think has its own value in culture and society. But this type of art is an art that communicates some way the experience the maker, the creator had to someone else that they can, they, they, they can discover even years later uh, by looking at the work. So the work itself embed, is, uh, encapsulates the very process that created it. Of course, it's something much closer to, to home Geometry was involved in all of my teachings when we would do 3D modeling, even with paper. This was part of an exercise that I was uh, doing when I was teaching Italias in 
But this particular image was, I have a friend who used to be my teacher, he's 86 years old, and he took the exercise and may, uh, basically did his homework. He wanted to do the same assignment just to be, you know, a, a funny friend, I guess. But he, uh, but he took it so seriously that he generated out of the same. So I, I, I don't know if you recognize here, you have a series of images of a piece of paper on which the same geometry was printed. And in each one, simply what happened is you cut and folded a different piece of that geometry. And then you, you studied it with the sun hitting it and seeing how the shadows are cast. Now, this is one, something very, very practical in many ways, especially in, in areas where we have a denser um, built environment where a building can cast a shadow on the rest of its surroundings. And, and if it's not well studied, it could actually be problematic, you know, that an area that used to enjoy exposure to the sun, suddenly it doesn't. So, so even just the, the idea of studying uh, the, the effect of an object in the, sun, in, the, in, the direct, in, the, in the way of the sun rays and how those get mapped on the ground is, is important because they carry the manifestation of this idea of geometry. And lastly, and this is where I'm going to get a little more um, demonstrative, geometry as pure joy. Now, that may be where I lose quite a few of you, but for me personally, it can be uh, an area where I can say that, like, let's uh, use music as an analogy. Music is always very close to architecture and design to help us understand uh, some key concepts. Um, in music, every musician, will will work with their instrument just for fun you know they will just play without necessarily following a score or without having something in mind they will just make sounds with their instrument and oftentimes it's just to keep the relationship with the instrument itself to have a an intimate good uh, um, connection with it and also to maintain agility and muscle memory for the parts of the the body that are important to play the instrument, whether it's the fingers, the the face in, in uh, brass instruments, etc. So for us designers, for me personally, geometry is that instrument. So oftentimes I will just explore a geometric ideas simply as if they were just uh, meaning of themselves a fun thing to do and to a certain degree extract joy. Now, how Frank Lloyd Wright, another Another important connection we all have to the Driftless area, um, connect, how he taught us how to see patterns in, in nature as part of, the, um, of this idea of geometry. So Wright called us to study nature, love nature, stay close to it. It'll never fail you. You know, he's, he was adamant that what he experienced as a, as a child in the farms of his ancestors in the, um, in the Driftless area and how that played out in his upbringing was, was very important. And of course, to that, he added this layer of understanding with the mind. He was using the Frable uh, block uh, gifts as a child. His mother had gotten them where he would make shapes out of these wooden pieces. And of course, eventually, as a young adult, he discovered the Japanese art of the woodblock prints, the yukioe. Both of them taught him significant lessons in how to see architecture in nature. And of course, you can see that in his work. You know, a lot of his the forms that he was making early on are direct extrapolations of these simple geometries, and the drawings he made to convey them at the time, without the computers and three D modeling they refer back to those Japanese prints. You see how he frames the sky through the trees with that notation. He doesn't use the, the fake effect of chiaroscuro. He, he believes the flat image the Japanese print has invites you as the observer to engage it and create depth in your mind rather than seeing depth being assimilated. Of course, Frank Lloyd Wright learned these things. Uh, he, was, he was encouraged. There was a book of biological illustrations of the 1800s, known as the French book in the fellowship. It was by Vernouille, 
It was a, the, he, he called it study of plants. And in that there were illustrations of plants in almost architectural drawings, plant section, elevation of a plant. And he loved to have it near him because it reminded him that a way to record nature is to actually draw it as if it were to be an architectural illustration. Now his teacher, Louis Sullivan, who we know as the father of the skyscraper in Chicago, had an interesting approach to how geometry related to nature. In, in a book that he called it the system of architectural ornament, he takes the pure geometry, in this case, if you can see the Pentagon, and then, and then on it, he, he grows a natural pattern of leaves as if it was the, the stalk and then the, the growth. Eventually, Frank Lloyd Wright takes only the geometry and makes that to be the essence of design. Um, in this exercise, his secretary, Jean Masseling, who came as a fine artist to the fellowship in the 30s, takes that idea and creates this beautiful exercise for all the students that Tali asked him to do, which is to take, a, observe a plant and create a geometric abstraction. Eventually that class fell in my hands and it was at the time where the computer came into play. So I was exploring the same exercise with the difference between drawing by hand versus drawing it on the computer, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the connection of, of this idea of illustrating nature for Wright became almost like a, a necessary way of developing this architecture that he, he left us, which I would say arguably is the most influential kind of architecture that the world has seen and in a per perpetual sense. In other words, people can discover Frank Lloyd a hundred years from now and still he could be relevant because of the way he he invited us to see nature as the generator of form. Now, next to it, I have the neoclassical example. And in a way, that's where I'm more implicated as a native Greek, where in the neoclassical time, everybody wanted to replicate the Parthenon. And we can see it in all the public buildings. And we can see it in Washington, D.C. We can see it in Madison. Uh, I don't know if Platteville has, must have a pediment with columns somewhere, Eric. Uh, so in a sense, uh, Wright said, that is done. We don't need it anymore. We, nature can help us find the new forms. And this is a little better an illustration of Sullivan's idea uh, of how a simple geometry can generate this beautiful natural form. Wright's reduction, as I would call it, down to the essential lines. You don't need the fake flowers to make it. Jean Masseling's beautiful ability to take uh, uh, free form and translate into geometry. And then of course the same exercise in, in my days, I was very interested to see how students went step-by-step step through the process. So at the end of the course, we used to have an exhibition and they had the final piece, but they also had to have a poster that showed the, uh, the, the steps they took to develop the form. Now I'll walk you through this process of how how this works. So let's say the sumac, which is a native plant in the driftless and one of my favorites, especially because during the summer, you don't quite notice it. And then in the fall, boom, suddenly there is this explosion of, uh, of red. And uh, of course, one of the things that this exercise asks us to do is to ask, what is the essential characteristic of this plant? In other words, let's take, a, let's take another plant, let's take a tree. Uh, we all can understand that an oak is an oak, a maple is a maple, a pine is a pine, a birch is a birch. Once you learn it, then you remember. Well, the fact of the matter is that there is no two identical pines or birches or oaks in the world. Each of them has its own expression of, of its form. However, something about an oak versus a pine invites the brain to recognize it as such. So the question this exercise asks, what do you see in a pine that makes it look always like a pine, even though it's never the same. Every time you look at a pine, it's a different type of pine, and yet there is something about it. Well, these are the, what Wright called, there's an essential character in everything that is on this, on this, in this nature. And if you tune to that, then you can use that to extrapolate your creative response. So I think we all recognize that in this particular plant, 
there is this interesting um, parallel line effect that the leaves have. Somehow there is something that this plant has that others don't. So the first step of the exercise is to try to capture that in a quick sketch. What is that essential pattern that the mind sees in the plant? And then that slowly translates into some kind of simple geometry that then in it, you can begin to map what you're seeing. So here is an effort to see how those parallel lines in these leaf stalks work together, but constructed in such a way that is not just expression of art, but it's actually articulation of geometry, which is a logical process. You can go backwards with this process. You can, you can understand where it came from and eventually develop a motif. And that motif then is used almost like a rubber stamp where you, you grow it out in, in a field. And in this case, the idea that it grows on a, on a stalk or on a, on a branch. And then you can start exploring different variations of color just to see how it can keep, keeps this idea of the essential character. And you can take it all the way to 3D where you can print it on paper, start folding it, making uh, shadow and light connections to the point where at the end, if you put them together, two things happen here. One is you can tell that what's on the right is not the same as what's on the left. Uh, it's, a, it's a representation of it. But the cool thing about it is that what is on the right could not have happened without observation of what's on the left. In other words, no one would have come up with this form out of the blue. And that is the point of this exercise is that it teaches us how we go from an observation to a creative response, which creates an essential understanding. And from that, then we can take it to the next levels all the way to uh, keep pushing the abstraction, kind of like that algorithm of the, of the bifurcation that eventually the tree falls in the, into itself. So other examples, uh, this, these are more uh, without the whole process. I was always fascinated by how the birch bark peels and rolls like this. So to develop a pattern that then can be photocopied and put on a cylinder of a car cardboard tube and then take the razor and cut these pieces of paper and start rolling them in order to simulate what, um, what the birch was doing in an effort to again see order, but seeing it with the tools of of the mind and the tools of geometry. Also another thing that, uh, that I never had seen when I came 18 years old in, in the United States was the cornfields and especially the way that the edge of a cornfield where you still see this vertical stalks and then the leaves blowing in the breeze, they always fascinated me. So one of my abstractions was to try to capture that with geometry. Similarly, seeing the burst of a pine tree coming at you through the sky and the branches, figuring out a geometric way to, to reconstruct it. Uh, or the giant soar in Arizona and how it, it commands space by simply accepting vertical, vertical orientation and anything that grows sideways, not too long and it'll bend upwards again. So finding what geometric uh, shapes can help examine that as a, as a, as a form, as a, as a principle of form making or a cactus that seems to be going chaotically in, in whichever direction in such a way that if it was a particularly dry season, instead of dying, it would just lose a few of the pieces that seem to be uh, uh, bifurcating and th thus surviving. And on and on and on, this exercise created a remarkable plethora of beautiful images. This is all student work from this exercise where um, in the study of architecture, where you have to have these projects, where you have to show how you learn how to put a building together with all of the challenges and demands of uh, making it realizable. This was the moment of reprieve where you go into into the quiet room with your instrument and you, you experience pure music without worrying about the performance or the examination. So in a way, this, was, this is the place where our, my very concept of, of how creative energy is practiced and, and how it is part of our, 
of my constant process of generating design. Now in architecture nature, this is my coda as I am coming into a conclusion is, um, is interesting to me because again, words help us here. So in the word information, which is the, the word of today's reality data information, the form is at the middle of it. So what does that really mean? That, that form is informed by something. Form is not random in this nature. In nature, form is information. So by looking at a form, you can find understanding of what makes it be like that. And information means structure. Structure both in a, in a, in a real way, like the strength of, of something to stand, but also structure in a conceptual way, which is an ordering system. Uh, we were told that in the later years, Franklin Wright was particularly interested in how spider webs existed uh, on the grass and, and when they captured the morning dew, they became even more manifest. And he loved seeing these tensile structures just, just on the ground there as you walk around and examine them as a great example of how nature develops form out of perpetual optimization. You know, there is a reason that these, these webs look a certain way. There's a reason that each species creates a different type of web. Um, but there's so much that we can learn from that. You can learn by being inspired by it in a very sort of like infantile way. You know, we all started with mimicking when we we're young and imitation is one of the early stages of learning. Eventually we become emulators instead of imitators. But when we look at nature and the symbiosis of form, structure, function, always being there, it captures our imagination. And on this planet, it also does it in different scales. Like the, the way a pattern on a leaf might look similar to a pattern on a beach with the water and the wind having shaped the sand. That somehow these forces always lead to similar recognitions of some kind of form that all of us can say, oh, I get this. This is interesting. Look at how that relates to that. And then every once in a while, you have these pioneers. This is a 1907 image of the guy who put the structure together. I mean, this is remarkable. You can see the structure alone and say, oh, that was done today. And then you see his, his attire and say, oh, my goodness, he did it then. How did he do that? How did he even come up with that? I mean, imagine what the world was like then. And here's somebody doing space age type of structure. Well, that is, I think, in direct understanding of observing all of these phenomena around us in nature. And of course, one of the things about the driftless area that our teachers at Taliesin emphasized is that because it has some of the most ancient manifestations of nature in North America, it is very rich in these, in these stimulants. Like in other words, there's the most ancient soil in the Driftless area that, that produces the, some of the most uh, rare species, both in, in uh, flora and fauna, and even the bug life. So it always fascinated me that Frank Lloyd Wright was born and developed in that very special part of the, of the country. And of course, in today's reality of the computers, we can, if we take those lessons, the computers become tools then to see how advanced they can get. You know, the nanotechnology these days can understand and create material that even is not recognizable to the eye. Uh, biomimicry, biomimicry tells us, for example, that the peacock feather with all of these bright colors, it's not, it's not color, it's actually light refraction. If you see the peacock feather in a microscope, it's all white. It's just that it gets the light and refracts it into these beautiful colors. Well, apparently with nanotechnology, we can now put coatings in, in, in ceramic tile that changes color by the angle of viewing. So instead of painting a building, you can simply uh, allow light to interact with it and create, create this different effect as if it were paint. paint. And parallel to Wright, a mind that we, we, you may, may have heard of, Buckminster Fuller, who was both an engineer and a polymath, he, of all of the things he did, the geodesic dome, everybody knows. But one of the structure he, he lesser, he's lesser known for is called integrity. But this is the one that actually captured my imagination early on, because what you see here is pieces of tube suspended in space. It's, in, it's almost like it, they defy gravity. 
So he defines this, that integrity is a system where tension and, and, and compression exist in a non, um, uh, non-linear fashion. It's like the compression is interrupted by tension and tension is interrupted by compression. And so you can basically build a whole tower out of these floating tubes. And it's a very strong, it's one of the strongest ways of making, making structure. Well, in my, in my um, mind, when I see these ideas, then suddenly I start imagining the future of what our buildings will be, understanding both uh, the energy that it takes to make our world more like nature does, but also the energy in our creative response to learn from these principles rather than just be ignorant, uh, made me think that architecture may be moving into uh, a, an idea where it becomes almost like armature for nature to really work with it. In other words, the way that uh, we can encourage a plant to grow, to grow on something by putting a lattice or, a, or on a fence and it'll find its way. It's almost kind of like that. So when you see, when you see these, um, these structures that invite the imagination to, to go beyond what is around us in our daily lives, then I believe that we are achieving this idea of armature. And uh, I'll show you a few images now of uh, imaginary concepts of this armature. Um, I, as, as Eric said, I'm very interested in tensile fabrics. I've done quite a few installations, but I'm, I'm wondering what would happen if those installations were done in such a way that nature finds a way to grow on them. And um, instead of it, it looking like a piece of fabric, it looks like, a, like the ground with its growth, the grass, whatever it is, starts to find that structure it's shaped by that structure and it's affecting that structure and ultimately it can be combined with with all all of the other types of uh, materials to create uh, an architecture that almost has the appeal that a beautiful tree or a beautiful plant has and and ultimately i think that's where my mindset is when you let nature win then all of us are winners in the end and all it takes is us to put our hands together and collaborate. So with that, I thank you. I hope we have enough time, Eric, for the question and answer. Wow, Ari, that was amazing. <laughs> I feel like you just gave a tech talk. A 40-minute 40, a 40 tech talk. <laughs> 45, yeah. I I love the part of your presentation at the beginning. Uh, you over you you present some uh, pretty powerful big ideas, and then you cut uh, to that uh, photograph of the family station wagon, and uh, I I was on mute, but I was laughing out loud uh, when you when you hit that part. That's wonderful. Yeah, it, it's a good way to understand the scale. Like, you know, in other words, even if it's bigger scale, we cannot be ignorant of it. Yes. Uh, so I'd, if, if you would, Ari, let's go ahead and stop sharing your screen for a minute. And, um, and we've got some questions coming in. And I'd like to start with a question for you, if I may. Um, you said that, uh, you know, you, you look to words um, for meaning you, about nature. You've looked to etymology, um, for example, and for example, you use the word information. Um, but you had something that you said that was nature is a call and response song. Is music a good analogy um, for nature patterns? And is looking is is music as good or 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 better um, analogy than uh, say literature? We're talking about mm -hmm. nature and nature patterns. Really good question. Well, the reason that music seems to be always a step away, a step near architectural thinking, and oftentimes comes to its rescue, is because we we all ex we all experience it directly. We all respond to music, and music is nothing other than a spe specially organized sound, you know. And and I don't know. There's so many interesting quotes about music that the nature of music is the the absence of the sound, like this, without having pauses there is no sense of music it's just uh, just sound noise and so it's the organization of these pauses 
And so let's take the concept of rhythm. You know, rhythm is definitely something that feels quantitative. There is, you know, in any kind of music genre, you can recognize the measure, which has so many divisions of full notes and half notes and quarter notes. And those, that's all, all well and done. And then suddenly you get the waltz, right? So the waltz is in a time signature that's three fourths. Well, three fourths is not a very uh, interesting, it's not a very e uh, easy concept to grasp even as a, as a ratio or as a fraction, because it seems to be fighting, you know, three and four. But what is it is the, is the, the, the way that the body moves, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and suddenly the feet go with it. So when you hear in music, like in Bach, a syncopation, which is an extra beat that seems to be in the wrong place, that's because in the dance, probably they were doing a skip, you know, where they were doing a little jump. So definitely music is a good way of associating pattern and, and pattern recognition because it's embedded in it in the sense of the structure of the rhythm. Now you can take it even further into what is the, the parallel of let's say melody versus rhythm. Rhythm is easy because it's beats and you can you can count them. How do you how do you explain like the the sweetness of a of a of a melody, whether you hear it in, in Mozart or, or in Bob Dylan? You know, there's something about the 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 sequence of of notes that also somehow invite invite our creative response. And, you know, some of us like respond to one melody differently than to another. That's, there's, there's no wrong or right in this. There is simply something for us to examine. You know, obviously we're not all the same. We all have different ways of responding, but one of the things that music does that often fascinates me is if you haven't listened to a song or a piece of music you know, for a long time, and the time you hear it again, it almost like a, a time capsule, you know, instantly you are transported back to the time when you even listened to it for a lot of many times, or you heard it for the first time, or it was associated with a very major event in life where there was a wedding, you know, a birth or a death. Uh, and it's, it's interesting how it is a, a way of understanding, uh, pattern and structure. Now here is my perplex, per, how I get perplexed about this. In music, we can all agree that there is both the concept of harmony, where the notes together create sympathetic resonance and they sound beautiful, um, or they sound, I mean, even if you don't want to call it beautiful, they sound uh, easy to listen to, easy to the ear. And then there is sound that is simply noise and sometimes very disturbing noise. Usually you won't hear it in nature, even an explosion of a volcano in nature could have a certain um, response to the ear. It may be a very bad phenomenon happening, but it's not the same as, let's say the collapse of a building, which is not a natural phenomenon. It's something human made that, that, that is getting destroyed. So I'm interested in how are we finding parallels, let's say to architecture, in other words, if neuroscientists in the future figure out that we experience space similar to how we experience sound, and all of these years, instead of listening to beautiful melodies in our spaces, we were stuck in cacophonies. And, and when you're stuck in a cacophony of space, then obviously that affects your behavior, affects your, your mental process, even possibly your mental health. And as a consequence of that, our actions, both individually and collectively. So it's hard to prove because space is not measurable in that regard. You know, sound is measurable in wavelengths because it's physics. And there are instruments that can take the, I mean, I used, used to play the cello and I had to learn how to listen to the tuning in my ear. Now on this phone, there is an app that listens for me and tells me if I'm near the node or not. And you can tell it instantly, like an instant feedback. Well, I think, I believe our beings are calibrated in such a way that the same thing happens to our perception of space. Why is it that when we want to have a break from our routine, 
We don't go in the middle of the place that we are in a routine. We go somewhere far, usually in nature, whether we go by the river, by the beach, in the forest. Why is it that nature provides that comfort from our otherwise, I guess, um, stressful lives? And, uh, and because I do believe that the way we experience space and as a consequence buildings is something that needs to be better done. Uh, and just because we have the technology to build anything doesn't mean that we should be building anything. And that's where Frank Lloyd Wright was instrumental and in why I think it is going to be important in the years to come, because he says that if you build in close uh, observation of nature and seriously understand how to make environments for human beings in which nature becomes part of your daily life. I mean, the way Frank Lloyd Wright organized spaces, he didn't do them just for the buildings to have a certain look. He did it so that when you're in them, you were in touch with your, the surroundings. You're never disoriented in a Frank Lloyd Wright building. He always puts you in an intimate connection with what was there before the building. And I think that is something that we barely are understanding collectively and we're barely acting upon. But I do hope that eventually science somehow will teach us how to do that so that we can realize that we were living in terrible buildings, uh, which were tantamount to terrible sounds. And no, you know, no surprise there that we, we developed pathologies in our understanding of ourselves and of the world. Sorry, long answer. <laughs> no, no, you, you're. This is wonderful, and to take this a little bit farther. So, is a nature pattern visualization that a designer would create? Um, is it uh, like a work of music, um, where the uh, result is supposed to be something may, maybe maybe mundane, like uh, a moment of of enjoyment, or is it supposed to be something more? Is and as is it supposed to be about understanding? Are we do creating knowledge and understanding or are we creating structure? Are we creating enjoyment or what is the purpose of this nature pattern visualization exercise? I see very, very, another good question. I think it's because it becomes this bridge between the world of art, the way we have defined it, which is basically a, a pure experience of liking or not liking, and you don't have to understand the work of art to appreciate it. It, it, it either cap captivates you or not, whether it's visual art or music. Uh, and on the other hand, you have the mental, mental heavy uh, world of knowledge in, as, it, as it is in the sciences, in literature, that it's all about the head thinking. What I like in nature pattern is this bridge that's created between visualizing and understanding, because when you see these patterns, you can analyze them. You can really break them down into how they were made. I can still appreciate the wet brushstroke of a, you know, of a de Kunig painting, which I recently had the pleasure of seeing again live in New York because it just simply has an emotional response. It's almost like, I don't care if I understand why he did it or why he didn't do it. I, uh, I simply can enjoy it. Similarly, somebody can enjoy any other artist, but we don't really understand how it was made. We don't even care to, you know, um, like when you, any of you have seen any of the statues of ancient Greece, for example, I remember the first time I saw the women that carry the, the frieze in the Erechtheion, which is the temple next to the Parthenon on the Acropolis. It's uh, seven women that, that are columns. And instead of being fluted like the Doric columns of the Parthenon, they're simply statues of women. They're called the Cariads, which means the carriers. You know, they're, they're carrying the, the trave and the, the, the rest of the roof. So they all have this relaxed posture. You know, the, the, the hip is slightly rotated. One of the, the thighs is slightly forward and it's sculpted out of marble. It's marble that has been eroded for thousands of, of years. And still you can feel the muscle, you can see and sense the muscle under the fabric. I have no idea how by simple act of reducting the material, taking it away and not being able to put it back if you made a mistake, you can arrive at that incredible representation 
of the human body in a particular pause, a particular action. Now, I don't understand how that's possible. I mean, it leaves me with this. I mean, I can enjoy it, I can appreciate it, but I don't understand it. But when I see the pattern of the planet Venus orbit, and I see that Pentagon and the, and the arcs, uh, something that invites me to engage my intelligence, to say, I can discover something here that I can take and put it somewhere else. In other words, I can use it from one place to another. And I think that the nature pattern exercise, I think it trains us to bridge the world of complete pure experience in art to the complete pure reason over here with the, the sciences and the, the literature, the letters. It's this in-between world. It's that, that, that uh, Venn diagram in a sense. And, and I think that one of the best nature patterns in our, let's say, popular art or, um, is the quilt makers. I mean, if you see these beautiful quilt, quilts that are such a vernacular, I mean, I always admire the quilt makers and I, not only because of the composition aspect, but how they understand the nature of the fabric, how the pattern of the fabric is repeated in a motif, how it all comes together. In fact, I had a colleague in one of my non-taliesin work experiences. She was the proofreader in a company, but she was also a quilt maker. And she, in her office, she had these quilts all around her that were absolutely gorgeous. And, and I remember that my gosh, this is command of geometry and pattern on a level that it doesn't even matter. She understood, I mean, a quilt maker understands the mechanics of how to make it. They probably learned it for somebody else in the process of apprenticeship or, and then everybody develops their own. I mean, in fact, I think the nature parties exercise could definitely benefit a quilt maker or somebody who uses organization of shapes in order to make something. Um, but I also think that ultimately an engine, the way it's put together, it's a series of geometric shapes, whether it's triangles or circles or rectangles or combinations thereof, and they all have to function together. So it's a system of patterns that have to work together. And, and it has been optimized by the minds of people taking an existing configuration and asking of it how it can make it better. What part of it is working better than another part? And so the collective layering of knowledge access to the previous version through the recognition of pattern to be able to add your part on it that's to me that collective ability to to progress and develop ideas and and the know-how is where i find the world exciting i also it's also the place where i can find despair when i see somebody young not caring how the world was made like the building behind you i mean we should care about our history because of that reason. So we're not blindly thinking that we're innovators. Chances are that anything we think out of the blue has been thought of out of the blue sometime in the past. <laughs> uh, what I appreciate about, about this engagement of accessibility to the way of thinking of somebody who did something and in it encapsulated their skill set, their, their intelligence, is that then somebody else can work with the same material. And in fact, here's music again, right? Take any Vivaldi, you know, the musicians today can play Vivaldi the way he played it in the 1700s. Well, how is that even possible? I mean, the, there is this symbols on it, like chicken scratch on a piece of paper that somehow make this sound happen with a group of people. I mean, to me, that is almost magical if you can use the word magical. It's like, how can you explain that? Well, to me, that is the power of how how making accessible our achievement to future generations, how that's important. And, I, and my unpopular theory is that pattern making, pattern recognition, especially when it really grows from the natural world is the strength here, is the, is the, is the, the super tool. All right, this is a fascinating conversation and uh, all of you uh, participating, this is a great time. If you'd like to uh, type in a question, I use that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, Sarah sends her applause, applause. Catherine says, wow, after 60 years, I finally have a clue what geometry is all about. She <laughs> says, thank you, thank you for the great introduction for me. My brain will never be the same. <laughs>
Uh, oh, uh, um, I, I, I've got a question for you. Um, so I really I appreciated uh, what you uh, you said about the uh, the caryatid, uh, those sculpted female figures serving as the uh, architectural supports, in which you've taken something that's a, uh, a, a a representative visualization that is a mental map that stands for something, but it's they're using it to do work. Um, in maybe in the at Taliesin, how did how did Frank Lloyd Wright use uh, his? Uh, his abstractions and, you know, or how do you use your nature patterns uh, in an architectural function? So the most, um, the most plain and direct use of them is obviously decorative. You know, you adorn a wall or, or a door or a window with these patterns. I'm more interested also in how they can influence the way, let's say I, I put furniture around because each piece of furniture in itself is a pattern. So when you put it together, it's, uh, it's a different pattern. Now we all have the, what I call the stereotypical um, reference and, and a stereotype, another Greek word, by the way. Ah. Uh, it, it basically means a, a, so, a solid reference, a solid reference. A stereotype basically means that something has enough power to continue to be a reference. So uh, whether we use it negatively or positively, it's a cultural thing, but the, the meaning of the word means something has the power to say, well, no matter what happens, I am a reference. So for example, you take a table and you put chairs around it. And then there is the standard way, even the way that the architectural graphic standards tell you, you put the chairs around this way, right? Here comes Frank Lloyd Wright, where in the early years, he, when he opened the, the, the dining room, the living room, all into one space, there used to be boxes in the house. Suddenly you see these tables that have in the four corners, a light fixture sculpture. And then the chairs themselves have a very tall back beyond your head. You know, not mine because I'm 6'6", six, six, but normal height of people at the time. Well, it's almost like he used the furniture to create a, an intimate space around the dining experience because suddenly you had this cavernous space and the box that was destroyed in a way was recreated, even though in a more, in less containing way, more like a reference. Um, later, he would bring a table out of the wall in this space which always fascinated me how instead of being an island, it was a peninsula. And that affected the way kitchen design developed eventually in the, in the 50s, you know, with all these peninsulas in every kitchen and these uh, pass-throughs to the dining room. You know, all of these ideas came out of a pattern recognition that Wright started questioning and then showing us examples of what's possible or the way a, stair a staircase in a house used to be mostly between two walls, eventually there was a rail and the rail could be something, you know, you can have a mundane stereotypical rail because it works, it's just there. Or you can start doing things like having a long um, pieces of wood that, that become something else and a rail. And so I find that, that beyond the, the, the decorative, which is the applique, the, the putting it onto something else, Patterns can help us even reconfigure our, our desk. I mean, uh, I always enjoyed seeing Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, photographs of Frank Lloyd Wright at his desk because I would notice what is on the desk, you know? And there was always a certain order, whether it was a, a document or a stack of letters, a book, uh, usually some kind of flower arrangement, uh, some piece of art. So when he sat at his desk, it wasn't just sitting at the desk. He created a microcosm of, of what I would call the call and response, this, this song that happens with, with our world. And yeah, you can experience it in nature, but you can also create it in your reality. Um, that's why when people say, well, I'm just messy. I don't accept that as being a final condition. You're messy right now because that's, that's what you become habitually uh, used to, and no one ever challenged you. Most of all, you've never challenged yourself on this issue. And I remember when I was young, uh, 
I never really, I, I, I had a desk and I did drawings, but I never understood this power of, of making beautiful space, even on your desk until I met a new friend and I visited him and, and I found, I, I discovered he had this corner desk and on the wall, he had these postcards and, and little posters and photographs of things that were important to him, whether it was tra travels, whether it was certain people. And suddenly that corner, instead of being a dead corner, it was alive with, um, with constant call and response, you know, images that, that you want to look at. Well, Wright tells us that that's, that's how you can live life. And then, of course, the most important one of all is to have a window through which you can see, you know, the tree, the river, the pond, you know, even the storm coming. Uh, you know, it's important that there is that connection, that a building should not isolate you from nature. Of course, you know, the, it begs the question, I know I mentioned earlier that I was just in New York City. I don't go there often, but when I do, it's it's almost like the apotheosis of, of human ingenuity in replacing nature, right? And Manhattan used to be apparently uh, almost like a paradise of uh, springs of clear water and beautiful sandy beaches. And then we went there and made this incredible forest of buildings. Um, well, this time I walked uh, a park known as the High Line. The High Line was a abandoned railroad track that was elevated like the the in the L in Chicago, and and the James Corner, who is a one of pretty predominant uh, landscape architect, with with the help of some other New York architects, um, created a park along this High Line. It's no it's no wider than fifteen feet at any given time. And it's about two miles long, two and a half miles. Um, and you walk it and it has become 8 million people a year visit it. It's incredible. It's one of the most interesting parks, it's like this long line that takes you from one end and drops you at the, at the other. One of the things that I noticed that he did there, even though I walked it at the time when the plants were still not uh, expressed, they're in their dormant state of the winter. Um, the pavement was made out of these strips of prefabricated pavers made of concrete, rough concrete so that it wouldn't be slippery. But when it would, when a planter would start, it almost like this hand opened the fingers and then the ground came and interlocked. So you had a piece of concrete gradually dissipating into this shape. And you saw it in every time uh, you switched sides on which part you were working on. And and I asked myself, okay, well, an architect probably would put a line there, you know, like a barrier, whether it's an edge, a beautiful piece of material, oftentimes it's a piece of, you know, steel. But here is someone who says, why can structure, man-made structure and, uh, and nature can be, can be in more like a symbiotic relationship, even visually. That's just a pattern. It doesn't really mean anything to the ground or the plant growth or to the efficiency of the pavement in, in a structural way. But as an experience of walking, you found that it had this interesting soft uh, fuzzy edge because you are in a very defined linear space. So otherwise it could have become maybe too prescribed. So it almost reminded you of walking a nature walk where the pavement was not dominant. It was constantly in conversation or even you say negotiation with the planter. Um, I find, I found that to be what New Yorkers are realizing that even the Central Park, as incredible as it is, um, in a city that is full of just concrete and steel and, and the replacement of nature, they want nature to grow back into it. And if you can grow on an abandoned railroad track, uh, and make a pleasant experience for people. That's the promise of what might be happening later. I mean, Frank Lurie famously said, build three mile highs in Manhattan. You get all the residences in three tall buildings and the rest is a park. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so I do, I, do, I do find that there is a, I think we're tending towards nature. And I said, tending towards knowledge was what the ancients said. 
I think where we are right now, if if I'm going to be hopeful, because that's a choice I still have. Otherwise, you know, I can accept the world is going, you know, to the cliff. I don't think so. I mean, there is so much inherent intelligence and goodwill and, and imagination. We simply have to retune where we focus. And I do believe that when we live in an era like the Driftless, which is so special, it's almost like our duty to not abandon the promise of finding a better way of being with nature and finding a way to to use its energy both physically literally and creatively and and then from that point flow it out there to the world i'm sure that Wright was not the only native of driftless area that gave to the world something important um even the miners gave to the world something important you know <laughs> gave the world important material well <clears throat> if we may back to something a little more elementary. So let's say we are here in the Driftless and we would like to uh, experiment with creating a nature pattern. Often a person will look at an object in nature in which they see some ge geometry. <clears throat> something, for example, a flower. And that flower, though, it has its geometry. It's uh, fairly simple and discrete, maybe a simple rotational symmetry. And so we can uh, perhaps see an underlying order in that and create a pattern. But then suddenly we find that we've created something discrete, maybe a mandala, which is beautiful, but it, it's stuck within the edge of the circle. Or, or maybe like a pattern you would see in a quilt which, in which there's beauty, but it's hard to do anything more than repeat it like a grid. How do we break that, uh, those edges and both uh, have a kind of a geometric order, but um, break out of the flower and into the landscape or into some uh, more complex conversation. So yeah, that's interesting because in um, in design, right again was was teaching how to do what I call white space or what is known as white space in uh, in in the graphic design, like a a portion of the page that you simply don't do anything on and it becomes a powerful place to juxtapose the thing the area where things are happening uh right does it in such a way that that is both present but not overwhelming and it's also not displacing but typically you know uh and that is the command of of not being afraid of the of the absence of something because oftentimes, again, we're calibrated or biased culturally to accept, you know, for example, dark is not good, light is good, you know. Uh, but without the, the, the shadow, you cannot have the contrast to appreciate light. I mean, the Japanese have made a whole cultural um, identity out of the shadow, how I appreciate the shadow. Uh, and so I would say that not just on the edges where you can easily not frame something in a square. Let's say if you're going to do a pattern on a piece of paper, in fact, in the in in April when I'm doing this workshop at the Shake Rack Alley in, in Mineral Point, which I did last year, this year I'm, I'm bringing scissors because I want people in the end to really cut the edges of the, of the, the square of the page, like create a pattern that almost doesn't have a, a, a distinct boundary and and explore what that how is that created is it created by one layer by two layers by three layers by one shape two shapes three shapes because ultimately that condition on the edge is 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 part of our ment our, our mental landscape if we think in boxes that means that those boxes don't communicate there is something powerful about a line creating a boundary uh, because it, div it divides the space, you know, to one side and another. But when that boundary is not that straight line, especially that definitive, powerful straight line, then it then simulates nature. You know, nature shows us that it creates this boundary condition that is never that definitive. It's there, but it's it's open. It's open to growth. It's open to receiving. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm perplexed by this building in Saudi Arabia, that, uh, that 350 mile long straight line. I don't even know what that is trying to do. But in a sense, it's such a, 
um, I think I would even dare say failure to recognize if we have the means we have today, why are we doing that kind of, again, it's like just because we can, that is me, we should be doing it. You know, I'd rather see how, have you, if you've seen any uh, termite mounds or, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they're incredible structures, you know, <laughs> or even, um, you know, the ant, uh, yes. you know, tunnels underneath our, our town's sidewalks that every summer, you know, they pop, they do a little puff and underneath it is an entire structure that's there. So, yeah, I think the edge condition is something that we should constantly explore how it is not, it's not divisive, it articulates, but it doesn't divide, it doesn't create either or conditions it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't force you to a duality in other words because duality is a trap you know we we need to be away from them <laughs> steer away well when we're creating these nature patterns you know we can we we can see that s s sometimes people will struggle to become uh, more mathematically precise um versus more artistic and so in this uh, push and pull be between uh, being the uh, geometer, you know, versus the artist, have you found that it's possible in creating a nature pattern visualization that it, it's possible to get too abstract? Yes. In fact, if it, it, again, if you keep keep pushing it, it'll eventually by by itself will will lose the reference to the plant. Uh, but. But that's okay because ultimately you're not trying to recreate the plant or to explain the plant. You're using the plant to create something that you would not have done otherwise. That's why you're going back to. I look at it. I mean, I remember the challenge when we were teaching that, and you know, you, you witnessed that was saying I abstracted the swallow. I mean, just in the choice of words there, you set yourself up. The swallow is abstract in and of itself as it is, and we established that. Even though there's no two identical, there is swaro ness in the swaro that is identifiable. So what you're doing is you're making an abstraction with geometry that is inspired, call it inspired, call it um, stimulated, call it challenged or by the swaro itself. But you're not recreating the swaro. You're not explaining why the swaro is. You're simply using the swaro as a call and response experience. So I think that's where finding the uh, the balance between being the artist and being the geometer is uh, is, is an act not unlike any any other sport where you're never really perfect at it and and definitely you don't get better at it by stop practicing. So I've always I mean I've always appreciated that this was one of the few classes at Talies in where people would come again even though they didn't have they only had to take it once according to the program but we had people who would come back and you know next time i did it with new students so you'd have three or four from the previous one and and then they would explain that well they feel like it's not something you do once and you're good at it or you're done with it it's something that you can just keep doing and if you come to the class it gives you an impetus to do it even though anybody can do that any time on their own um I do think that when you're again with a group, you get the communal energy of encouragement and motivation, which I find that we need so much from, especially as we're recovering from that isolation experience. Uh, and, and even just gathering like this evening is, is nutrient in, in so many ways for all of us. It doesn't matter whether right now I'm talking, there may be another time when anyone else here is talking. But yeah, that's the... We have a couple of great questions. Uh, Mary Kritz asks, uh, countries differ in their cultures, obviously, and architectural styles. Which country or society has, has captured the geometric methods that you've discussed and achieved some of the kinds of harmony that you've discussed well what's interesting about this is that there are two references the one that i'm more familiar with is the japanese because they use nature directly as a reference now it's interesting with the japanese they're also the culture that manicures nature hmm. i mean manipulates it to almost to the extreme they make cubed watermelons so they stack better they're 
fixated with the perfect apple, you know, um, but in their demeanor, this comes from an utmost respect and, and, and uh, admiration of nature. So their expressions in, in geometry, in their culture, have that uh, wabi-sabi, they call it, is the imperfection idea that something cannot be completely um, tied up, buttoned up, and made perfect. But co in contrast to that, and this, this, will, this will sound tough for, for a lot of us, is the architecture of Islam. If you see what they've done with geometry in those buildings, the calligraphy on the geometry, the mosaics, the, the, the pure complexity of, of curvatures that have, I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, without computers and, and you, you admire all that. And, and unfortunately we've experienced only the, the, the negative side of that culture, unfortunately. But to the point that, I mean, I come from a culture, um, I was born in a culture that for 400 years was occupied by the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire in and of itself had beautiful expression of art and architecture. I mean, they were a version of Islam. Um, the, but they, they, destroy, they tried to destroy anything that Greece had before in order to install the new reality. And somehow 400 years of that did not kill the Greek spirit. And eventually 200 years ago, they actually on the 25th of yesterday, we had the celebration oh. when they started uh, revolting and eventually with the help of other countries like Russia and, and, and France and Great Britain, they, they basically defeated the, the Ottoman Empire. But the Greek culture, the language, the history was all kept alive in these secret schools that were in caves. Um, so I, see, I, I have a, a direct visceral negative reaction to anything that has to do with that culture because it was a culture that was trying to destroy mine. And yet, when I see some of that architecture, what we call arabesque, right. uh, it's absolutely incredible. I mean, and, and it goes, you go into this bizarre world. How can the two be part of the same culture? You know, how can the two expressions, the this, this simply destructive one on one hand and the incredibly creative on the other, come from the same culture? It's, it's, it's really amazing to the point that I almost don't enjoy seeing that i mean i recognize the the perfection of, of islamic architecture but it's a part of me that cannot be a, cannot allow it to enjoy because then i in a way endorse <laughs> the other side of it and and it's almost like you know i'm i'm scared of that yeah. that, that's if interesting that you bring that up um i've heard people say something similar about 20th century german art you know, we knew that so much of the geometric school of art of the 20th century, you know, came from an understanding of Friedrich Frabel's kindergarten system and the use of these uh, wonderful geometries and rotational symmetries, which unfortunately we saw even in the uh, the graphic design of the swastika, for example. Right. But right. on the other hand, the Bauhaus and some of these other wonderful things rooted in some of the, the geometric forms of Frabel, surely they're, you know, they're really beautiful. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the power of symbols is again in the stereotype. It's that there's a solid reference. And the swastika was a Tibetan symbol originally. You can still see it in Tibetan tangas. They did flip it. I mean, there is a direction in the swastika, but the 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 German used it as the visualization of the SS. You know, that's what it was. It was a diagonal and it had to be the two S's with the most powerful black, white, red color scheme you can imagine. I mean, yeah, I mean, the power of that to use creativity in a destructive way or as a symbol of something painful is where we find our limits. As I said, you know, just because we can do something, what is it that keeps us from, from doing the thing that doesn't belong? That is not necessarily, I wouldn't call it wrong, but I would call it, ineffective it does not serve any purpose to go in that direction other than destructiveness or or pain or suffering that's the line that i draw you know if if any of that if this ingenuity and creativity is used towards 
um, demeaning the human condition rather than enhancing or elevating it, then I put the line there and say, no, I'm not going to go past that line. It's, it's where, where my humanity says no. Dina's got a great question to help bring us home. And, and that relates to how patterns can be used to not just demonstrate what should uh, be good in architecture, but perhaps to demonstrate the failings of architecture and the negative energy that it can impose on nature. She, she says, when an architectural design is being sold or uh, described as harmonious, but and, and the collective public might believe it, but the design is demonstratively not harmonious on a musical level or otherwise, you know, how could you, uh, prove that, if you will, by using some of the uh, methods that you've talked about? You know, this is a, such a good question. I had this uh, pipe dream of creating an app for this <laughs> that simply would, uh, like, you'd open your camera and you would choose different uh, geometries to, to superimpose on the image and start seeing the world through almost like a, a, a kaleidoscope. You know, the kaleidoscope is a really beautiful a, a demonstration of how geometry can, you know, in a kaleidoscope, we have a piece of, a, of an image that exists that then through optics and reflections, it creates this kind of like a magical non-existent experience of seeing this pattern. Well, imagine having, um, if we had arrived at uh, collectively agreeing that, let's say, uh, just for the sake of argument, Triangular uh, places, uh, triangular spaces are bad for your health. They're like cancer, and so, <laughs> so if you could take a, an instrument and you superimpose it on an existing condition, and then it could give you readings. You know the way they they use instruments to read, let's say, toxicity on a you know asbestos or lead or you know their quality, that they could be a parallel way of measuring the pattern of the of the of the existing building and then bring in a, a green check or a red x and say eh, no that's not a good one and then we replace those buildings <laughs> with the ones that pass well i mean you just described my ideal world but again you know uh it would be and why not i mean the way we diagnose our, our bodies for for illness it's relatively a recent, if you take the whole human experience, the arc of the human experience, the, the means we have today to, to troubleshoot um, disease, it's so, they're so advanced and, and effective compared to, let's say, how they did it, you know, a thousand years ago. Uh, but again, the most effective ones, and I, and I remember my, in my graduating thesis at, uh, at Taliesin, I had to do a medical facility and and I had to grapple with the concept of healing. And um, even though healing was accepting mortality, you know, the hospice movement um, and, uh, and asking oneself, can space, the quality of the built space have anything to do with that uh, when it comes down to the diagnostics. And, and I found out that, you know, in ancient Greece, the whole idea of, uh, of healing was to put the patient in a special place. They call them the sanatoriums. You know, the usually um, you would remove them from the conditions in which they fell ill, so that nature and, and the nature in them, their body's ability to to be healthy, combined would then would then restore health um, because they didn't have other means. You know, so they they was purely environmental. So. If somebody's sick over here, you take them out of where they are because chances are the conditions there make make the sickness or cause the sickness. And so, if you don't know how to how to cure it, at least you stop you stop harming it. And in fact, the hip, hip, the Hippocratian oath that the doctors to the present day have to take starts with first do no harm. Uh, it's uh, it's the duty of a of a physician to first do no harm. Now another interesting architectural thinker, uh, Bruno Zevi, who was Italian and one of the people who embraced the organic idea of Frank Lloyd Wright, brought it to Europe. 
he used to say that the architect is a surgeon of the of the ground of the earth itself so and the reason i think he used the surgeon reference was much like a surgeon before they cut through the skin need to be really ready to and know what they're doing because so much is at stake a human life we should approach digging the ground to put a building in with the same kind of awe and and fear in a sense you know fear of doing the wrong thing and and first do no harm well we experienced the Arizona desert. I first went to Taliesi West in the 80s, where it was surrounded by the Sonoran Desert. And gradually over the decades, we've seen developers come and scrape the desert clear, save a few cacti, and then redo it, and then put them in, in, in the, uh, you know, the medians and the parks uh, on the sidewalks. The most manicured roads you'll see in any, in any city are in Scottsdale. And uh, nobody's on them. Maybe occasionally somebody walking a dog, but not even that. There are these incredibly large, beautifully landscaped, uh, uh, lands landscape sidewalks that nobody uses, and uh, and it makes you realize that what even in my work to today with with the whole custom farms that I do, I often have builders that say, "Well, I just clear all that and then restore it." It's like. Who do you think you are? I mean, you think you can just take out a piece of ground with all of that growth in it uh, in one scoop with your machine and, and then come back with the, your arrogance and say, I will restore it to, to bring it back to the building. Wright was teaching us how to understand how to place the building on the contours so that you only dug how much you needed. You didn't dig more, you didn't disturb the ground beyond what the foundation and the, the practical idea that in order to cut a hole that doesn't fall in itself, you have to have a little bit of a taper, but that's about it. You wouldn't dig 10 feet past the foundation or level the ground or reshape it. I mean, that's the whole point of the organic in his, in, you know, one of the strongest ones. Like you don't, you don't do so much harm and yet it's still common practice in, in our ability to think that we can just restore it so easily. Well, it doesn't restore. I mean, nature takes time to restore for sure, but it's the arrogance behind it that is so disturbing to me is that why not be more mindful about how much you need to destroy, to destroy in order to build something. Find the fine balance, but so yeah. <laughs> well, I, th I think uh, perhaps without even hearing Mary's question, you've really addressed uh, this matter of uh, how um, the principles of transforming nature go beyond the walls of architecture and extend out, say, to the garden and into the natural landscape. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I uh, we've been on such a journey um, with your with your talk, Ari. I appreciate that you began um, with the ancient origins of design and uh, with the the big Greek philosophers. You know, of course, the those philosophers also speculated about things in nature such as the genesis of ore deposits um <laughs> and you know if and if we could only know how they were formed then we'd know where to explore for them and we had uh, those followers of pluto who thought all ore deposits <laughs> from volcanoes and all and then the neptunists who thought that uh all ore deposits came from superficial waters and these are this is some of the language that uh, we like yeah. to speak here at the mining museum um, this uh, idea of the flow of uh, ideas and the flow of people. Um, uh, of course, uh, southwestern Wisconsin uh, is a home to many migrants and immigrants, uh, bringing a fascinating cross-section of ideas. Um, it was uh, so special to have you uh, here today, Ari. Uh, I, I appreciate your sharing your time, sharing your wisdom with the museum audience. Thank you all very much indeed. I enjoyed it immensely preparing for it and experiencing it here. I one of my favorites of recent times I can think of. So well, isn't that wonderful? I, I feel like um both uh I and and those who have uh, remained with us uh, for this talk uh, could keep the questions going for hours, <laughs> but we will not put you through that, all right. And uh, in fact, perhaps you, Ari, would like to know, and the, all of you uh, watching would like to know that next Sunday at 5 p.m. we'll have um, one more Lyceum. That'll be number seven of our series of seven this year. 
and Kevin Watson will be presenting live from Yorkshire in Northern England, his talk um, on immigrants uh, to Southwestern Wisconsin from Weardale to Wisconsin with the miners of the North Pennines. So thanks to all so much for participating in this program of the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museums, and good night. Thank you. Good night.